Okay, friends. Uh, now we are going to talk about the phosphoinositide signaling system. That means the si signaling system which involves the phosphatidylinositol as well as uh, uh, the G protein uh, receptor uh, signaling. Okay. Now let's begin here. The eventual uh, the eventual activation of phospholipase C inside the cell begins with the binding of an external ligand to the cell surface receptor. As you can see, when the external ligand comes in and binds with the cell surface receptor, uh, it activates the alpha subunit of a heteromeric G protein, which is here. Now, after the activation of the heteromeric G protein, uh, the release of GDP happens, uh, and the substitution of GDP is done using GTP. And uh, and uh, after the attachment of GTP with the alpha subunit, which is a bigger subunit of the heteromeric G protein, this alpha subunit is getting dissociated from the other two subunits, which are beta and gamma. So this dimer separates from the alpha subunits. Now this alpha subunit goes uh, and attaches with the phospholipase C. And what happens? Uh, the subunit diffuses towards the phospholipase C. Upon binding to the phospholipase C, it is getting activated. Now GTP hydrolysis is happen and uh, GTP is uh, converted into GDP and phospholipase C is getting activated and alpha subunit is, is get is setting back to its uh, previous form of GTP GDP bound or inactive state. Now this alpha subunit can go and attach with uh, the beta gamma subunits uh, to form uh, the again uh, the heteromeric uh, heteromeric G protein uh, to carry out the further round of this process. Now this activated phospholipase C will go on and do the next works. Now this activated phospholipase C catalyzes the hydrolysis of P PIP2 into two different segments. One is PIP, uh, one is IP3 or inositol triphosphate, uh, which is having the phosphate in three different positions of inositol one, four, and five positions, and it also produces a DG or, or DAG or diacylglycerol. Now this diacylglycerol remain in uh, in uh, the cell membrane uh, are embedded in the cell membrane because it is having the two do uh, acyl uh, chains uh, to this glycerol now it is present in the cell membrane but the ip3 or inositol triphosphate having three phosphate groups uh, can move on uh, to the next level of activation now ip3 can go and attaches with the endoplasmic reticular membrane uh, as calcium transport channel protein and what it does it, it activates the transport uh, transport of calcium from inside the in the plasmic reticulum uh, lumen to the cytosol. Now, as uh, soon as it binds with uh, this uh, calcium transport channel, this channel uh, is activated and transports the calcium uh, to the cytosol. Now, this calcium and, and this IP3 uh, can also be converted into IP2 by the hydrolysis reaction, as you can see here. Because, as we know, this IP2 is also important to make the PIP2 again, because we need to have, have a sufficient amount of PIP2 to carry out this kind of IP3 reaction as you can see in the in the previous examples okay so right after the production of calcium as you can uh, look at the, in this case so another fact is that uh, the production of calcium uh, can increase from about 0 0.1 micromolar to the 10 micromolar the lifetime of the second messenger which is ip3 in this case uh, is limited by the presence of hydrolytic enzymes in the in, in, in the cytosol okay so we are having this hydrolytic enzymes like the inositol triphosphatases they can come and hydrolyze this ip3 into ip2 because if IP3 presents in higher amount inside the cytosolic environment, it can activate much more calcium transport channel. That means much more calcium ion can be uh, transferred from the lumen of endoplasmic reticulum to the cytosol, which is undesirable in all the situation or all the time. So we can only do this kind of reaction when cell need that. That's why it's a general way or it's a, it's a logical way to convert this IP3 into IP2 by the hydrolysis uh, of this IP3, by the hydrolytic enzymes. Now the increased cytosolic calcium stimulates the calcium binding protein in this case which is calmodulin. Now this protein is de uh, designated as CAM. Now this calmodulin is in kinase to activate the protein kinases. So this calmodulin can in turn activate the protein kinases and what this protein kinases are going to do, this kinase are going to attach phosphate group to to the desired protein and this desired protein is getting activated and this activated protein can f further uh, mm, produce the cellular response so that is the basic goal okay now again what can happen this calcium can go another pathway it can go and attach with the phospho 
phospholipase uh, protein kinase C, which which is previously bound with DG or diacylglycerol here. Now it can attach with protein kinase C and activate this protein kinase C, and this protein kinase C in turn again going to phosphorylate proteins, uh, which further carry out the cellular response. So this uh, production of this uh, calcium and attachment of this calcium with calcium binding proteins in turn are going to activate different level of different type of protein kinases and thus they can activate many intracellular proteins which will carry on the cellular responses on uh, the future time okay so that's how the cellular response are being made only after the attachment of an extracellular ligand inside the cell using this uh, uh, phosphatidylinositol pathway